All right, continuing on then, uh, our consideration of 1 Corinthians 9. <clears throat> a couple of things that the Corinthians were accusing the Apostle of and therefore, or thereby questioning his apostleship was that he could not have seen Jesus Christ risen, therefore he was not an apostle. That's one of the things they said. Secondly, Paul did not live like the other apostles. He was different. He was unmarried. He was solitary. He was a wanderer. He didn't indulge in the ordinary comforts of life like Cephas did with his wife and the half-brothers of the Lord did with their wives as they travelled around. He was not like them. He was not normal, it appeared. You know, he was just a single man, unusual, t like obsessed with things, like totally committed. He, he didn't live a normal life. And so there was these sort of implications that were drawn that he wasn't really an apostle. Uh, thirdly, Paul and Barnabas were compelled to labour in paid work to sustain themselves. So Paul, as he travelled around, would actually work as a tent maker to make his own money so that he didn't need to rely upon anyone for accommodation and food and the expenses of daily life. And so he, he would work his fingers to the bone as a tent maker and then preach in, in his spare time. Now this was evidence, according to the Corinthians sceptics and critics of, of Paul, that he was aware of his own lack of apostolic credentials. He was too embarrassed to live like the other apostles and ask for sustenance and uh, support. <clears throat> and the other thing, Paul did not claim expenses from the ecclesia as he travelled and the fact that he did not urge this right proved that he wasn't a real apostle. These were the kind of charges that were made against the apostle Paul by these Corinthians who were trying to undermine him. So these are issues that are addressed in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And so he's going, he starts explaining the right he had to support. Now it seems uncharacteristic of the Apostle Paul. The whole four, the first 14 verses, we feel a bit uncomfortable reading this. You know, 1 Corinthians 9, we think, oh, why is the Apostle arguing for his rights, for his liberty to claim expenses from an ecclesia that he was visiting? including the Corinthian Ecclesia. It just seems so uncharacteristic of him. And point by point he makes to underline that he had this right. And the first arguments are around the nature of the case. That is, we can see the principle in daily life, as we've mentioned, the soldier, the farmer, the shepherd. All these vocations are supported by the vocation itself. They're, these workers are paid by the fruits of those who are benefiting. The authority of scripture in verses 8 to 10, quoting from Deuteronomy, thou shalt not muzzle the ox, the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. And by the way, I've got these up here, because do not muzzle the, uh, the ox. <clears throat> then in verse 13, he goes further. But before he gets to verse 13, you can see the mind of the Apostle Paul at work here. Look what he says here in verse 12. Well, verse 11. If we have sown to you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? What he's saying there is carnal things just means money, basically, in this context, and food and things for, to sustain the, the body. He's saying if we are sowing to your spiritual well-being, is it a small thing that I can expect back from you that you would support me in food and clothing and shelter while I'm with you, just support me in those carnal needs while I am giving my whole life to support you in your spiritual well-being. And, and as they travelled about, it was reasonable that they could expect these things. That's just reasonable. And then in verse 12, if others be partakers of this power over you, and he's already mentioned that Cephas had a wife and the brothers of the Lord travelled with their wives and probably others. It was customary for these apostles to travel around and for the ecclesians to support them. You might remember that the, the Philippians gave money to Paul on a number of occasions and he, generous, he, he acknowledged their generosity and accepted the money from them. He's going to say to the Corinthians that I have never taken a cent from you. The Apostle obviously picked up very early on 
that these people were not people from whom he should take money, ever. And whilst he accepted money from other generous souls around the place where he visited, he never took any money from the Corinthians. He obviously made that decision very early on. And it shows how perceptive the apostle is. This particular group of people would throw it back in his face one day if he did. That's, he knew that because of the culture of these people. And he's going to say that in a minute. But he says, verse 12, If others be partakers of this power of you, are not we the rather? In other words, don't I deserve it as much, even more, than Cephas or the brothers of the Lord? Because I've already established the fact that I travelled to Corinth first. Many of you are in the truth because of my work in Corinth. If anyone is due this kind of support, surely I'm at the top of the list. Now the Apostle's going to continue with his argument in verse 13, but he can't, he almost can't continue the argument. It's, it's almost catching in his throat to, to be arguing in this way. And so he, he intervenes in the middle of his argument. He doesn't wait till the end. He says, look, I just want to point one thing out to you. And it's halfway through verse 12. But, or nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Now, so in the midst of him arguing for his right, he, he intervenes halfway through and says, look, I just want to emphasise to you, I've never, ever exercised this right. So in establishing the fact that I have the right to expect that you would pay for my expenses while I'm with you, I want to interrupt here and just say, hang on, don't misunderstand me. I've never, ever exercised this right or liberty or freedom. I've sacrificed it for your well-being. You can see immediately the connection with chapter 8. I have sacrificed all of that expectation that I could legitimately have of financial and material and support from you for your sakes, lest I should hinder in any way the spread of the gospel of Christ among you. And so halfway through verse 12, he can't wait. He's got to blurt that out. Verse 13 is a continuation of the argument to establish the right that Paul had to support. And he moves on to consider, in verse 13, the example of the Levites and priests under the Jewish law. So he's already considered soldier, shepherd, farmer, the na in nature. He's already considered the written Mosaic law, where it says, do not muzzle the ox. The next thing he moves on to consider is the example of the Levites and priests in verse 13. Do not you know that they which minister about holy things live of the temple, <clears throat> and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. So in this verse, he draws on, first of all, the Levites, and secondarily, the priests. The word ministers is the word ergasmi, which basically means to toil or to labour. And the Levites were ministers or servants or labourers in the tabernacle under the Jewish law or the temple. And they live of the things of the temple. That is, they're, they're maintained by the tithes. So in the way God set up the temple worship, the Levites and the priests were supported they did not to need to plant vineyards or plant crops and, and water them and work you know, during the day to grow these crops so that they could then eat and then in their spare time work in the temple. No, no. All of Israel took tithes and those tithes went to the Levites and then of those tithes a, a small percentage went to the priests. And in fact, <clears throat> the priests themselves were partakers with the altar, the second so the first half of the verse talks about the Levites. They live of the contributions made. You might remember in the Old Testament it talks about the tithes being given to God and God giving those tithes to the Levites. In Numbers 18 verse 24 that's talked about. And also in Numbers 18 it talks about the priests being sharers in the altar to which they ministered. So what happened was the offerer would bring a sacrifice and with some of the sacrifices the priest actually took a portion and it was their food. It was made to God, the sacrifice was made to God, but God gave a portion to the priests which they would then share with the other priests and that would be food for the people who are ministering at the altar. What does this principle teach us? That God has embedded in his law a mechanism to support, materially support, the needs of those 
who minister to our spiritual needs. <clears throat> and not only that, but the Lord Jesus Christ taught the same. So the nature of the case, four, four prongs of his evidence to support the point that he's making. The nature of the case, the authority of scripture, which is uh, Deuteronomy 25 verse 4, the example of the Levites and priests, and then the teaching of the Lord himself. Verse 14, even so hath the Lord ordained <clears throat> that they which preach the gospel shall live of the gospel. That's verse 14. Now there are a number of occasions where the Lord taught this, but uh, I'll just, note, I'll just uh, tell you a few. Matthew 10 verse 10, Luke 10 verse 8, Galatians 6 verse 6. I think I've got these on the screen. I've already talked about that nature illustrates the right in verse 7. I'll just deal with this while it's here. <clears throat> he says, I have never exercised this right lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. What does he mean by that phrase, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ? Well, in the first place, Paul knew that if he took money from the Corinthians, he might at some future time be accused of being mercenary. That is, being in it for the money. Paul couldn't bear to face the accusation that he was in it for the money. That he was making some personal profit. He couldn't bear such a thing. Because that would only hinder the reception of the gospel in people's minds. If they, if they heard that Paul was making money out of this, it automatically makes you cynical and sceptical about the motivations of the preacher. If they're making money. So Paul obviously could foresee that such an accusation would be brought. Secondly, it would have lessened the moral impact of his urge to preach. If he was paid, it would detract from his real motivation, which was his appreciation of the death and resurrection of Christ and the saving message. That's a much more powerful motivation than money. That impels us to do even more. If we're paid a certain monetary amount, we limit our service to what that monetary amount is worth. But if our real motivation is the appreciation that Christ has died for me, how much is that worth? There is no limit to what we, can, what we should or feel obliged to do if such is our motivation. Paul foresaw also that might have alienated some who might otherwise have been attracted to the gospel if they heard that he took money for what he did. And further, and this is related to chapter 8, it would have prevented the exercise of self-denial of liberty or that which he had a right to, which he was now setting forth as the recommended course of action regarding meats off to idols. He foresaw that if he forewent that right or liberty that he had to expect to be his costs to be covered, if he didn't forego that right, how could he then advocate that self-denial and sacrifice is the nature of our lives? And so all of these things Paul foresaw could hinder the gospel of Christ in these ways if he took contributions to his daily subsistence from the Corinthians. Now, with respect to this fourth point, that the teaching of the Lord taught the same, when Jesus sent the disciples out to preach, he said this, Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor staves, for... And here's the principle, the workman is worthy of his meat. So again in Luke 10, in the same house, when you're travelling around doing your preaching, in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the labourer is worthy of his hire. <coughs> That's the principle that Jesus taught the disciples. Accept hospitality, accept care for your daily needs while you are ministering to spiritual needs. Go not from house to house and into whatsoever city you enter and they shall receive you. Eat such things as are set before you. So what Jesus is saying is it's perfectly okay to accept hospitality, to eat the food that's set before you, to, to sustain you while you are ministering on, uh, on, to their needs. Now this is further expounded in Galatians 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate or share unto him that teacheth 
in all good things. <clears throat> Weymouth's translation of this same verse says this, let those who receive instruction in Christian truth share with their instructors all temporal blessings. Now, what's being taught here is that the hearers should feel the obligation to share. It should not be needed that the instructor says, oh, sorry, I really can't afford to... to I haven't got enough money to buy my lunch. Do you mind sharing your lunch with me? That should not need to happen. It, the obligation should be felt by those who receive the instruction to share with the instructor all temporal things. Have you got somewhere to stay? You know, stay with us for the night. Have a meal. You know, while you're in our midst, we'll show hospitality and we'll care. This is the obligation on, on those that receive such ministration. That's what Paul teaches in Corinthians. So the obligation should be felt by the hearer rather than insisted upon by the teacher. So, but that's uh, the teaching of the Lord. Now, the word but in verse 15 is possibly the biggest but that the apostle has ever used. In fact, he couldn't wait. He actually used it halfway through verse 12. We noted that. But we have not used this power. We, I want to emphasize that. I can't wait till verse 15. Halfway through the verse 12, I want to get in there. But then he says, repeats it in verse 15. But my whole explanation of this right, do not misunderstand me. But I have used none of these things. Neither have I written these things that it should be so done to me. For I, it would be better for me to die than that a man should make my glory void. What he's saying is this. I want to emphasise this. I have never, ever asked you for any money. Further, I, I have not made this argument in verses 1 to 14 so that next time you might offer me money. In fact, I would rather die than to take money from you in this circumstance. Because if I did, it would make my glorying void. Now the word glory means boasting, but it it's not a boast in that sense. It, it also means to joy or rejoice. And so he says, I would rather die than that any man should make my glory void. For, and to explain what he means here, this word for joins the next verse onto that thought, for, I have, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. What he's saying here is, if I go around preaching the gospel and people look after me and pay my way and so on, I feel like I'm not sacrificing enough. That's not enough for me just to give my life to preaching the gospel and, and me relying upon others to pay my way. That would be a reasonable uh, thing to do. And I can understand others doing that. I'm not criticising others, says Paul. But I think that would be just doing what obligation lays upon me. Uh, of course I should preach the gospel. Yea, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. I could not live myself if I, with myself if I didn't live my life preaching the gospel. After what's been done for me, I feel like my, it's only reasonable that I give my life preaching the gospel. I want to give something more. I want to sacrifice even more. If, if possible, I can. And this is one thing I can do. I can forego any right I have to material su support as I travel around, and so I do. And it's my way of sacrificing even more for others than I could be reasonably expected to do. And he goes on, verse 17, For I do this thing willingly. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. Actually, verses 17 and 18 in the AV is really badly translated. It, it disguises the meaning completely. Uh, this, I'll just read what it says here. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward, but if it, against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Does that obviously make sense? <laughs> it, uh, it's not very clear in the AV. What he's saying is here, for I, I, if I do this thing willingly, I have re a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? What he's saying is, God's after volunteers. God wants people to volunteer. And I want to do as much as I possibly can for God. 
But if I do it because I'm going to get paid for it in some way or get some reward from it, what's, what's my reward then? In fact, I want to, verse 18, what, I want to go beyond that. Verily, I want to preach the gospel and make it without charge. In other words, I don't want to be charging anyone for my time or meals or accommodation. I don't, I don't want to be an imposition upon anybody. I would feel that that would be abuse of my liberty. That would be somehow abusing my power in the gospel. I, felt, I feel like I would be overstretching what I should do if I did that. And so what he's, what he's saying in verse 17 and 18 is that I want to go beyond. I don't want to do just what's reasonable, but I want to do something above and beyond what's reasonable. I want to really sacrifice any liberties I might be perceived to have. And so he says in verse 19, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself slave to all that I might gain the more. And so he's saying, I'm putting myself at service to others and I forego any right I, might, I may have to, to uh, temporal blessings received from ecclesias I visit. And so he's saying this, Paul's boasting. He, he says here in verse, um, the end of verse 15, I'd rather die than any man should make my glorying void. What's he, what's he mean here? What's Paul's joy and glory that he's getting at here? Well, he's saying, firstly, that he had preached the gospel without expense to anyone and had thus avoided the charge of greed or avarice or being hungry for money. That's one of the reasons why I joy. I don't put that stumbling block in anyone's way. So that's a similar stumbling block to me insisting upon the right to eat meat. If I say, oh, thanks, I, I want to receive some money, I've come and preached to you, I need some money to reimburse me, that may be a stumbling block to someone. They may think, oh, he's doing it for the money. He wanted, he wanted it that he had been able to keep his body under and pursue a course of self-denial that would lead to happiness and joy in the kingdom. In other words, he wanted to provide an example of self-sacrifice. That's, that's what his joy was. He wanted to be an example, a role model for the kind of people we should be. And if any man had supported Paul and exposed Paul to the charge of greed and lust for financial gain, Paul wouldn't have been able to live with himself. It would have been a dampener on his joy if such accusations could legitimately be made against him. And I just note that Paul showed great insight and forethought by acting in this way. It would have been easy in those early and exciting enthusiastic days in Corinth when the Ecclesia was just being established to have been tempted to receive support for his preaching in that positive environment. But Paul knew what was in man and he acted wisely and he never once took a cent from any Corinthian brother or sister. Now, that, those confusing verses there, the diaglot says this. For I, if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward. I feel like I'm doing something uh, for God. But if I've been entrusted with my stewardship reluctantly, what is my reward then? So, in other words, if I go around preaching and I'm doing so thinking, oh, this is costing me a lot of money, I'm not eating very well, I'm, I'm going to actually ask people for, to pay me, to reimburse me for expenses. If... If, if I'm all the time seeking for my money to be reimbursed, it looks like I'm doing it reluctantly. So, I've made the decision that when evangelising, I will establish the glad tidings without expense so as not to use my authority or freedom in the, glad, in the spread of the gospel. So, I've decided not to seek reimbursement at all from the Corinthian Ecclesia, for anything I do for them, so that I don't abuse that right that I have so that it might not be a hindrance or a stumbling block to anybody. I'm going to go over and above. Now, doesn't this correlate with what I'm asking you, Corinthians, who want to insist on eating meat? Doesn't that correlate? Okay, I might be saying to you, yes, maybe think about going over and above what's reasonable. But you say to me... You haven't done that, Paul. You wouldn't sacrifice like that. You're asking us to do something unreasonable. Paul says, I am doing that. This is how I live my life. I will sacrifice over and above what's reasonable if I consider that it will better enable the gospel to be spread and people to respond to the message. 
Look at what Paul said in Acts 20 in his final advice to the elders at Ephesus. He said this, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands... You might remember Paul, this was his last visit to Ephesus. He would never see them again. They came down to the beach to meet him, you'll remember, and they all wept because it was the last time that they were going to see him and he, he warned them about wolves in the ecclesia that were imminent and so on. But Paul said, you yourselves know that these hands pointing to his own hands, have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. What the Apostle is saying here is that I made tents as I was travelling around to preach the gospel to make money to pay my expenses, my travelling expenses, and everyone who was travelling with me. So that as I travel around with my party of, of helpers in the gospel, Timothy, Silas, Barnabas, etc., I pay for all of them out of the work that I did with my own hands and never once asked an ecclesia or demanded from ecclesia any reimbursement. I have showed you all these things how that so labouring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus how he said... It is more blessed to give than to receive. This is the principle that Paul lived by. It's the principle that he was trying to teach the Corinthians in this question about whether to eat meat offered to idols. And it's, he, that's why he made tents everywhere he went, working his finger, fingers to the bone, making tents uh, by night so he could preach by day. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. He lived his life that way so that we might learn how to support one another, to sacrifice whatever needs to be sacrificed, to be giving people rather than taking people and to learn the blessing of what it means to give and to support others rather than to ask for support and demand support. Now, this is such an important lesson for us, isn't it, that we live our lives giving rather than being takers and not to come to the ecclesia thinking, oh, I hope I get the support I need today. You know, often I go to the ecclesia and no one supports me. No one does things for me. And uh, I'm, I'm sick of going because no one, no one cares for me. What the Apostle is saying is that it's all the other way around. What am I doing to support others? This is all the question we should be asking ourselves. What am I doing? It's more blessed to give than to receive. And so if all of us are coming to the Ecclesia with the attitude of giving support to others rather than expecting to receive how blessed we shall all be. Because rather than just me and my little problem and, and my circumstance expecting support, everyone here is giving. And how much more blessed can we possibly be if all of us have that attitude uh, towards one another? Similarly, when he wrote to the Thessalonians, the apostle said this, For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you, Neither did we eat any man's bread for nothing, but wrought with labour and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. What he means by wroughting uh, with labour and travail night and day was he made tents so that he might earn money, so that we not, might not be chargeable to any of you, so that there was no sense of obligation felt. Not because we have not power this liberty to ask for money from you, but to make ourselves an example to you of how to sacrifice so that you might follow us in this attitude of sacrifice. Doesn't this correlate with 1 Corinthians chapter 9? You can see how the Lord taught it. You can see how the Apostle Paul, it's, it's smattered throughout his writings. He's teaching us to go over and above in our service to one another beyond what's reasonable. And so he continues on here, having established this principle and why he did it. We'll go back to verse uh, 19 to pick up the context here. For though I be free from all men, though I have the liberty to expect these things, I am not a slave to you. I don't have to slave while I'm there, but I volunteer to be a slave. I give myself in that way. 
So he says, though I be free, technically free, yet I've made myself slave to all that I might gain the more. Paul doesn't see it as, as a loss to be counted as a slave to his brothers and sisters, but he sees it as a gain, as a profit. And it's a gain in many ways. And he's already said that it, it helps the promotion of the gospel. He sh- he's a role model to others that they may follow. So the fruit of of the spirit is seen in others who might follow his example this spirit of 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 the willingness to give and the willingness to sacrifice for others and he explains how he has done this unto the jews i became as a jew that i might gain the jews to them who are under the law as under the law that i might gain them under the law to them that are without the law as without the law being not without law to god but under the law to christ that i might gain them that are without the law to the weak became i as weak that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. These are beautiful words. He first of all turns to the Jews and he says, to the Jews I became as a Jew. Paul was a Jew, of course, but he had left behind much of what Jewry held to be of great worth and he accounted a but done, he said to the Philippians. But nevertheless, he went into the synagogues regularly to preach to the Jews. And what he's saying here is, when I went into the synagogue, I went out of my way not to offend their sensibilities on matters of diet or dress or in any, any little area. Because I wanted to preach the gospel to them and I didn't want there to be a barrier, some sort of barrier over a small thing that they might get sensitive about. So I didn't rush into the synagogue and and say to them, oh, I'm not keeping the law anymore. Oh, that's all history to me. I I would go out of my way to become as a Jew that I might reach them so that I might convert them to Christ. So I removed all the stumbling blocks out of the way as I approached them to preach Christ and him crucified. To the Jew I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. And what he's talking about here is uh, the proselytes, Gentiles that had been proselytised to Jewry. So they're a separate group, like Grecian Jews. And they were a separate group who needed to be treated separately and, and their sensitivities were slightly different to Jews who were born Jews and brought up as Jews. And so to that, to those, to that particular group, I... I was sensitive to their needs as well as I preached, so that I might gain them that are under the law. And verse 21, to them who are without law. And to those who are without law, it refers, of course, to the Gentiles who were never subject to the law of Moses. And to to these, Paul didn't burden them with the requirements of the law. He didn't rush into their midst and start talking about the expectations of the law and why they weren't keeping them. Why would you? Paul taught Christ by passing the law to those people. He did not burden them with the requirements of the law and he didn't complicate their lives with his own background in the law. A, a good example of this is, is Timothy and Titus. Timothy was circumcised and Titus was not circumcised. And Paul was seen in this particular issue to be fickle and inconsistent. But of course it was not the case. If you want to read about that, it's in Galatians 2, verses 11 to 18. Paul had a, had, a, had a reason why he asked Timothy to be circumcised but not Titus. And Titus's main work was going to be in Gentile ecclesias and he knew that uh, it would send the wrong message. But with Timothy, he had different plans. Now, Paul didn't think circumcision was necessary, but to the Jew, he became as a Jew that he might gain the Jews. And this principle was being lived out with uh, Timothy and Titus. Now you'll notice he says here, to them that are without law, as without law, brackets, being not without law to God but under the law to Christ. He wants to get across here the fact that I'm not advocating lawlessness. To the Gentiles I didn't advocate lawlessness. What I advocated was that we're under the law to Christ. And the law to Christ requires much more, actually, than the law of Moses. And I enjoined the law of Christ upon them, the Gentiles but not the law of Moses and the specific rituals of that law. But I advocated fulfilling the law of Christ, which, by the way, in Romans 2 verse 14, the Apostle Paul uh, explains to the Romans 
that actually the Gentiles fulfilled the law in coming under the law to Christ. He ful- uh, the, the Gentiles fulfilled the intent of the law. So it was not advocating lawlessness, and he just clarifies that point in the brackets in verse 21. So I never compromised God's principles in, in, in the way I behaved in this way, but I just removed any possible stumbling block that someone may have to the message I had to convey. And then in verse 22, and this really brings it home uh, to the issue at hand of the brother of the weak conscience and meets off at the idols. To the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. In other words, I took on the sensitivities. I understood and empathised with the sensitivities of the brother with the weak conscience. I would not eat meat off of the oils if it offended someone, if it was going to cause an issue, if there was going to be any hint of someone being offended or tripping up or it causing them a spiritual stumbling block. In other words, to those weak, I did not shock them by my conduct. I complied with their customs, their dress, their habits, their diet, their manner of life. I abstained from any food that might offend. You see, Paul's objective was to save them. And he didn't make an issue of perhaps some non-fundamental things that might in any way jeopardise their road to the kingdom. And so he says, in these eloquent words at the end of verse 22, I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. So this phrase, I am made all things, you can put in brackets there, I was as flexible as far as I could be. I am made all things. I am as flexible as I can be in dealing with different cultures and different languages and all kinds of differences amongst the people that I preach to. To all men, what that means is, there is no one I would not preach to, there is no one I would not try to save. There is no one beyond the pale of salvation on these issues of culture and dress and language and background. That I might by all means, what that means is, I used every possible endeavour. There is no energy I would not expend. I would do anything, crossing oceans and mountains, anything, to get to these people, to preach to them. And even with all that expenditure of energy, that flexibility of approach, that all-encompassing attitude, even then, of course, the gospel message only was responded to by some. But I never wanted to, to that, that group that's called some to be less than it could be because of some issue that I created by my conduct, my lack of flexibility, my lack of energy. I wanted to give the gospel message as big an influence as I could possibly allow by my conduct. And even then, only some will respond. But everything had been done as far as Paul was concerned. Every option available was used, including the foregoing of any rights that I might legitimately assert. And this I did, verse 23, for the gospel's sake, that I might be be partaker thereof with you. This is all for the gospel's sake, that it might be extended that no one might be that the, that the gospel might not be hindered by anything I might do, that you might be a partaker, that I might be a partaker thereof with you. And this word partaker is a co-participant. You see, I did all this for your benefit, Corinthians, and anyone else that's reading. I I did all this that others might benefit. You Corinthians are the direct beneficiaries of my policies in preaching, my. You know, you can almost see Paul thinking, my initial response when I arrived in Corinth was that no one's going to respond here. I want to get out of here as quick as I can. But the Lord taught him differently from that. And he expended every effort. And there was great fruit. Many people, many of the Lord's people would have been found there in that unlikely circumstance, in that immoral city. Now he turns now. There's a bit of a bridge passage here at the end of verse 9. Uh, chapter 9 to the beginning of chapter 10. And he, he actually inserts an analogy of the Olympic Games, or should I say the Isthmian Games. Yes. 
All right, what, what Paul has established in the chapter thus far is he has exercised self-denial and self-control. He has foregone any rights or liberties that he might rightly claim for their benefit. And this is a, he's providing this as an example to them for what they should do in their exercise of their liberties or the sacrifice of them in relation to eating meats off to idols. Paul now is going to change the thinking. He's going to change the whole emphasis of what he's saying. And so far he's been emphasising the fact that this self-denial will be for the benefit of your brothers and sisters. If you choose not to eat meat off of the idols, if you choose not to go to the idol temple and sit in that idol temple and eat meat, it will benefit your brothers and sisters who might be sensitive. But now he's going to change the way he addresses the subject and he's going to ask this question. Is eating meat off to idols of any benefit to you, Brother Libertine? And is going to that idol temple really something that you can safely do for your own spirituality? Forget about, I mean, I've, I've emphasised the your consideration of others, but think about your own spiritual well-being. If you assert your right to go into that idol temple and do so, are you really going to cope with that? Are you really following the Lord's example of self-sacrifice and are you really showing the kind of self-control that a brother in Christ should do for their own spiritual well-being? Think about that. And he's going to, he's going to draw this in by talking about the Grecian games. Now, the Greeks were famous for their sport. And there were four major sets of games in ancient Greece. There was the Pythian Games, there were the Isthmian Games on the Isthmus just outside Corinth, there were the Nemean Games and the, there were the Olympic Games. These were held on a schedule once every four years. So at Olympia, once every four years, the Olympic Games would be held and we've reinstituted that in modern times. But really every year around the Grecian world there were games going on and every four years there was one set of games held just outside Corinth. So every four years there were all these athletes coming into Corinth and they were witnesses of, of the heroics of these Olymp Olympians, who, of these uh, sportsmen. And of course Greek heroes like Hercules were athletes who achieved great prowess. A lot of their legends were built around these sportsmen just like in our modern world, we have legends who are sportsmen. But what uh, Paul is going to do is drive his lesson home that he's been talking about throughout this chapter in a practical way by drawing the lessons out of the example of drive, determination, deprivation, self-sacrifice and single-mindedness of these athletes and asking the question, is the Corinthian libertine who is dabbling in, around the edges of idolatry and even going into the idol temple is he showing the kind of single-minded commitment to Christ that maybe he should be? Think about that. And he's, he, again, he's continuing with these rhetorical questions. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize? The word race is the Greek word stadium. So you can see immediately uh, that this is, we're in the realms of, of you know, ancient Greek infrastructure, the stadium or the race course which would have been well known as a major landmark outside Corinth. It was a place in which contests in running were held and uh, the one who outstripped the rest and reached the goal first received the prize. Courses of this description were found in most of the larger Greek cities and were like that at Olympia, 600, uh, 600 Greek feet in length, so says Thayer in his comment upon this particular Greek word. It means the location of the race. So the runners uh, are all running but only one receives the prize. So run that ye may obtain or gain that prize. What sort of application do you need to run? He's saying one person wins. What is the level of application and dedication to the cause that you must show to win that prize? This is the sort of dedication that we must show to our life in Christ. And so when you look at the number of allusions in the New Testament to spiritual athletes, there's obviously in Hebrews a number and Paul draws this out in more than one place. When you put it all together, the advice Paul gives us about how we should behave as spiritual athletes can be distilled down to this. What do spiritual athletes do? We're all spiritual athletes. How do we live our lives? Well, they give themselves wholly to God and make this the grand business of their lives. 
They don't dabble in other things. They completely dedicate themselves to winning that prize. They lay aside every weight. They renounce all improper attachment and anything that might be an impediment. They get rid of everything, says Paul in the Hebrews. They lay aside everything that might weigh them down. In fact, they competed absolutely naked in the Greek games. They, they put off every piece of clothing that might flap in the wind or you know, anything. Third, they do not allow themselves to be diverted from their object but keep the goal constantly in view. They're always envisaging the success. They don't grow weary and flag. That is, they keep going, they keep applying themselves and if they do feel a bit weary, they, they talk themselves up, they get a coach and they, they get coached and they get looked after and they, they keep marching towards that prize. They're persistent. They deny themselves the kind of indulgences that ordinary people might, might allow themselves. They get up at 2 o'clock in the morning or 4 o'clock in the morning or whatever crazy thing they do to, to train and train and train. They go to the gym. They're back in the pool. They're running on the track. They're lifting weights. Everything. Diet is such an important part of the preparation and they, they don't eat or indulge. They don't go out late at night. And, you know, If you hear any interviews with... Uh, uh, athletes that have been to the recent Olympics, they, they can talk about getting their normal life back after retiring from the sport. They can now spend some time with friends. They can spend some time with family. And it just indicates t the extent to which they deny themselves for the goal that had been ahead. They keep their eye fully fixed on Christ as their example. That's what spiritual athletes do. Hebrews 12 verse 2 tells us. And they receive strength and encouragement from those who have formerly succeeded. And so there's like a hall of fame. There's records kept. And we know the standard to which we're striving because others have attained it before us. And we draw strength from that as spiritual athletes. And we look back at former people who've lived their lives in faith and we strive in the same way. And that's just a few things that we can draw from the lessons. Now here's a, here's a group of Olympians from Australia recently who won a gold medal. You can see the big smiles on their faces. Their dreams have come true. Here's four faces of people who were very disappointed. They had given their lives, they had sacrificed so much. And the Apostle is drawing out the importance of coming first, of winning the race, of gaining the goal that you've set yourself. And here we have all these Australians that have come 6th, 4th, 7th, 7th, 4th, outside the medals. And they come home with nothing. And they're devastated. I mean, 4th means you're 4th fastest in the world. That's not bad. But they, they feel like they've failed. So run that you might obtain. In uh, Athens in 2004, they reinstituted the tradition of putting a laurel wreath or a wreath on, uh, on the head of the winner. And actually this is uh, mentioned here uh, in verse 24. I'll come to that in a minute. I just want to note here that here's an example of someone that we've never heard of. You know, these people sacrifice so much for their victory and it means so much to them. And yet what a temporary thing it is and how fleeting is fame. You know, this guy rushes Yuri Borzakovsky celebrates as he crosses the finish line to win the men's 800 metres final in an Olympics. And he, he's just achieved his goal, but, I mean, who here has even heard of him? That's how fleeting the fame of, the, of, of this kind of achievement is as far as these athletes are concerned. You know, bringing it home to Australia, Babe Diedrichsen centre breaks the world on Olympic records for the 80 metre hurdles in the 1932 Los Angeles Olympics. This is an Australian athlete who won gold medal. Who's heard of her? I haven't heard of her. This is an Australian. think we know this person, but we don't. She's, been, she's died. She's been forgotten, largely. Unless you went searching for her name, you wouldn't find it. And yet, how much of her life did she dedicate to that? Because she thought she would become immortal, having won the gold medal. So run that you might obtain exercise the kind of commitment and self-sacrifice that these athletes demonstrate in our spiritual lives. That's what we need to do. Now, there's a two-fold comparison here that Paul's making. Firstly, how does our commitment 
to our spiritual goal compared to theirs? Getting up at four o'clock in the morning, going to the gym, swimming, 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 back to the gym, back to the pool, back to the track, lifting weights, sacrificing everything, special diet. You know, there's nothing that you won't do. There's nothing you won't sacrifice to attain that goal. How does our commitment to our spiritual goals compare to theirs? That's the first comparison he's making. The second comparison he's making is how does our reward compare to theirs? We've already seen by those previous examples that these people are largely forgotten decades on. Largely forgotten. Unknowns. As their, their, perhaps their records or Olympic records get replaced by others and their name just recedes into the background. But what about our reward? It's going to be eternal. He goes on and he says in verse 25, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we do it to obtain an incorruptible. This word, striveth for the mastery, means to agonise. Every man that agonises for the victory at the Olympic Games is temperate in all things. This word temperate means to exercise self-restraint. We've got to sacrifice some things. That may be the idol's temple. That may be eating meat. That may be all kinds of things that we need to sacrifice. We need to exercise self-restraint. The Olympians do, the athletes do, we do too. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown. This is the Greek word stephanos. Uh, sorry, uh, the word crown is stephanos. The corruptible is thartos, which means it decays. And it's interesting to note, uh, I think I've got it on the slide, this word stephanos, which means the wreath or the garland that they put around their heads. It was literally a corruptible crown. And at the Olympic Games, they've got a wreath of olive. At the Delphic Games, they've got a wreath of apple leaves. At uh, the Corinthian Games or the Isthmian Games, they got a lovely wreath of celery and parsley at the Nemean Games. So that was something to, to work for, wasn't it? That's what they get. And look what they do. There's the Stephanos, which was given out at Athens. But it, going back, they do it to obtain a corruptible Stephanos. We and incorruptible. How much more should we be? Now in verse 26 he says, I therefore so run. Not as uncertainly, this word uncertainly means to not have a clear objective. To sort of get up in the morning and think, what will I do today? Oh, I'm not sure. I might do this, I might do that. I might get around to doing this, I might get around to doing that. I don't run like that. I have a clear objective and everything I do contributes to that objective. I do not run haphazardly, I do not exert myself for nothing, says Barnes. I know at what I aim and I keep my eye fixed on the object, I have the goal and the crown in view and everything I do is planned around that objective. We need to have a clear idea of what objective we're about. And if we're young people, it's, we've got our lives ahead of us, we need to think about that. You know, sometimes you don't live your life as a young person thinking, what kind of people do, do, do I want my children to be? What kind of people do I want my grandchildren to be? We don't have a long-term view. But maybe we should think about that. The decisions we make going into the idol temple, how is, what impact is that going to have upon the people around you that you love? Is it going to help their spirituality? Is it going to help yours? Think about whether it's going to contribute to your life's goal or whether it's going to be de detrimental to it. This is what we do as a spiritual athlete. Have a vision, therefore, of what you want to achieve. Evaluate your present progress continually towards that vision. Set clear goals for yourself for improvement as you're on your way. Set measurable and achievable short-term objectives and strategies. Write them down. Have, you know, and, and just check on how you're going. Re-evaluate your progress regularly. Examine yourselves. We say to each other, don't we, on Sunday morning? And don't give up because of a bad patch readjust, get back on track. We all have bad patches from time to time. You know, we need to take a longer term view. Often the seeds of the mess individuals, families or ecclesiastes may find themselves in were planted and watered 10 to 15 years ago. We need to plan now for the fruit we want to be harvesting in 10 to 15 years. What sort of people do we want our children or our grandchildren to become? What do we in our life, what we do in our lives now will determine that to a large degree. These are the things we need to be thinking about as spiritual athletes. So don't run uncertainly. Have a clear objective as to what you're trying to achieve. 
So fight I, he says, not as one that beats the air. This word fight means a boxer. He's changed the image from a runner to a boxer here. It's a pugilist, it's a boxer. And he says, I don't fight as one that beats the air. Now, I used to think this had to do with shadow boxing, you know, practising like this. It doesn't mean that. The word dero means to... It's the Greek word dero. And it means to flay around uncontrollably. Like, like a dero, I suppose. <laughs> and it, it relates to the word uncertain, uncertainly. It, as a boxer, I don't enter the ring thinking, my strategy is going to be this. I'm just going to flail my arms, uh, arms around as much as I can and hope that one of them hits and knocks the other guy out. That's not how a boxer uh, plans his fight. He doesn't fly around hoping that by some mark of good fortune one of his punches might hit. I have an objective to keep under my body. Now he says here, hupo, hupo piazzo actually means hit under the eye. To buffet or disable an antagonist as a boxer. This is what the word... I want to punch under the eye. In other words, when I'm entering the ring, my enemy is standing... He wants to knock me out and I want to knock him out. It's either he knocks me out or I knock him out. I'm going to... I'm going to go in with a plan. And my plan is going to be this. I want to hit him under the eye. He's my enemy and I'm going to hold, I'm going to conserve my energy and when I get a chance I'm going to go whack straight under the eye. And I'm going to put him down in one punch if I can. If not, I'll just keep going. In other words, I've got a plan and I know what it is. I'm going to try to hit him right under the eye. I'm going to cause the blood to come out. It might cause blindness and then I can attack him and take him down as a follow-up. This is my plan. Now, the, the enemy in the ring right now is my body, says Paul. I take this approach with my body and bring it into subjection. Now, why is he saying this? Well, I know what my temptations are. I know what my weaknesses are. And I know that going to certain places and doing certain things are not going to be in my battle plan. And I know that going up to that idol temple and having a meal of fellowship and sharing with my mates up there while they are thinking that we're worshipping the idol and I'm up there with them, maybe that's not a good idea. The temptations that are there will not be good for me. And so I've got to think about, Mr Libertine, and you have to think about this too, is, is that such a good idea? For a boxer who has a plan to get into the kingdom for a runner that has a plan to win the, win the prize. And Paul says, for me, I've got a plan and I've got to, keep, I've got to watch my body and I've got to bring it into subjection lest, it, lest by any means when I preach to others I myself should be a castaway. What Paul is saying here is I could lose the race at any moment. I know that in myself. And so the phrase my body identifies the enemy, our body, the seats of sin's passion. Romans 7 verse 23, I see another law warring in my members. It's warring against the law of my mind. This is a battle, this is a fight going on here. And I br it's bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. I've got to fight against that. I've got to fight to the death against that. And bring it into subjection. It means to be a slave driver, to enslave. In other words, showing no mercy. It's a fight to the death. You're in the, the boxing ring. The other guy wants to take you out. And if you just go in there with sort of some lackadaisical attitude, you'll be on the flat on your back on the canvas. So this is the attitude you've got to take. This is how you need to approach the battle, to get the other guy down and keep him down. And Paul says, for me, I can't take my mind off the battle for one minute. I don't know about you, Mr Libertine, who thinks he can go into the idol temple and put himself in temptation's way with all that we know goes on there. For me... That wouldn't work because I, the Apostle Paul, could be a castaway if I don't take this seriously. So in 1 Corinthians 9, the summary, Paul is a bona fide apostle. Paul has a right to claim expenses as an apostle. Paul chooses never to exercise that right, however, for the gospel's sake. We must choose to further the sake of the gospel rather than to assist on our rights, whatever they may be, including eating meat or visiting the idol temple for the sake of our brothers and sisters. And we need to apply ourselves to the goal ahead with self-control and self-sacrifice, both for the sake of others, the weak, the brother with a weak conscience, and for the sake of our own spiritual well-being.
BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section, where any Ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own Ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week, which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds, so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings, and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post, there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's milestone snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on world news events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.